This conference will now be recorded. Thank you. Um, so thanks very much to the PWI. Um, and we, we gave a presentation uh, probably nine months ago on pantograph monitoring uh, across the Western route. Um, and this presentation today, as, as Julie's mentioned, is, is really about uh, the, the, the rigid over line conductor system installed by uh, Fru and Frey or designed by Fru and Frey and installed by uh, AMCO and, um, and, and the Network Web project team. Um, I'm sure there'd be many discussions and presentations on, on the installation. This is really um, slightly different to, to, look, to look at and to give you a, a flavour of what now has been built, it's in service. Um, now, some of the some of the little uh, challenges we face as, as we go forward, and basically, you know, we, we need to get to know the tunnels and, and, and the environments. They're all different. I'll, I'll, we'll have a little look at the, some of those challenges as we go. Um, and Twenty years ago, I managed uh, a tunnel up in Corby um, as a PUA engineer. I guess I'm a PUA engineer at heart, um, and and that was a, equally a challenge environment uh, from from a track point of view. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at them. As we go through, okay. So we'll take a little bit of entry to service, uh, a little bit on the system description, geometry, the environment, um, inspection and maintenance, uh, solutions to some of the challenges, pantograph monitoring, as you can see, uh, and then a little bit on, on asset management. Uh, Tom Garner will talk us through uh, some of the uh, electrical discharge monitoring practices, which we're we're looking to adopt, and Elena Ionescu will talk us through the the, pan, the position on pantograph monitoring and the stations we've got uh, shortly being commissioned. Okay, so for, for those who don't know, um, we've we've got the original red line conductor system at Chicken Sodbury, Patchway Tunnel, Seven Tunnel, and down in Newport. Um, they, they were built sort of uh, sort of during the 16, 17, and 18, and, and running traffic uh, during January 19 to Chip in Sodbury, as you can see, and 2020 Patchway 7 Tunnel of Newport or thereabouts. Um, and, and they've been in service now for for some time, and and actually performing quite well. In, in fact, I would say I would say very well. Um, there are some little little quirks, little things we've learned. Um, which will inform our inspection uh, arrangements as we go forward and we'll, we'll just go, get those through. Um, and, and as you're probably all aware that you know, there's nothing new with, with, with conductor rail systems or red line conductor rail systems that, that are used all over the world. Um, and indeed, that's what goes through the central operating section with Crossrail. And there's a couple of systems, I believe, in, in Scotland. Okay, what is the rock system? Well, it, well, it's, well it's not that, um, but that's just a reminder for those who don't know uh, what is a, a more conventional overhead line system in, in, a, in a tunnel. You, as you can see, you, you've got contact wire catenary, uh, your registration arms, lots of insulators, uh, dro droppers and jumpers, and then you've got the tensioning system and the overlap, uh, and, and then the overlap of, of the wire runs. So, um, as, as we take a look at the rock system, you know, just be, be, uh, take take note of what a conventional system is, because uh, there, there are there are pros and cons to each system. Um, what you, what we found with uh, tension systems that the the temperature in the tunnels is is, is sort of you know, it's, it's an inert atmosphere. There's not much movement, and tension systems can indeed uh, be problematic because they can they can seize up. So. Um, one of the benefits of, of the conductor rail system that it's that is untensioned and um, it, you, you don't have the, the the overlap arrangement you don't have your jumpers and your droppers and you don't have uh, a tension arrangement so that's just a, a bit of an overview of what a, a conventional system is and we've got one of those um, and that system down in, in the Heathrow tunnels um, on, on the western route So as you can see, um, perhaps th th there's a, a, an example of, of, of a conductor rail system. You've got your conventional drop tube and, 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 your, and your cantilever. And then in here, you, you've got the uh, aluminium extruded section, which houses the, uh, the contact wire. We'll take a closer look. Um, but perhaps it's important to, to remind ourselves why, you know, why conductor systems are favored. And that's 
primarily because of clearance. You, you can't get a conventional system in, uh, perhaps the environment. Uh, aesthetically, people prefer um, system operators prefer uh, a conductor rail system, particularly in station areas. Um, and those, are, and it's less mechanical. Though it's a mechanical system, uh, you haven't got pulleys and wheels and overlaps and, and droppers and jumpers. So, just to, when we talk about the the system on on the on the western route, there's just a very simple breakdown of what what is considered part of of the of the overhead line uh, contact system or, or the, the rock system um what is or what isn't um and as you can see in this photograph um this was uh you can probably tell us some years ago just immediately after installation by um by amco okay and so just a a quick overview of um, what's tensioned and what's untensioned. Um, as, as you can, if you if you can imagine a red line system, it, it's suspended uh, with contact wire or catenary external to the tunnel with some uplift from the pantograph. Uh, as as the train enters the tunnel, um, this the, the system changes from what is effectively a kind of floating system with a bit of uplift from the pantograph. In, into a rigid system, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's what we call a transition bar, which is um, which takes the the uplift from the pantograph and it, and it reduces it down, so you go from a, a more, more of a softer system into a more rigid system as you enter as you enter into the tunnel, um, and then the first part of of the the beam uh, and the wire and the conductor beam is tensioned, and as you go into the as you go into the tunnel. Uh, past the anchor point, then it becomes uh, then it becomes untensioned. So, that's a very uh, just a desktop photograph of the aluminium extruded section with the contact wire um, sort of clipped in place. You can see here, and all, all on the western route, there are two types of contact wire used. We've got the copper silver, which is the um, used in the majority of the tunnels, and to to address them, to address um, any bimetallic issues, uh, aluminium is used in in the seven tunnel with with a, with a slightly uh, increased cross sectional area. What, one of the benefits of an untensioned system is is actually the um, with a tension system, you you can only sort of get away with uh, reducing the cross sectional area by I believe 30% um, with, with an untensioned system, you can actually get much more out of the wire because you can, because it's untensioned, you can just run it down to, uh, as long as it doesn't follow the, the aluminium extrusion section, you can get a much more value out of the, out of the contact wire. That's an additional benefit, I guess. Um, but you can see the, the tail end here of, 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 the, um, of the transition beam. As you come in from the outside of the tunnel towards the road inside, you start to approach this section, which stiffens it up as it runs into the um, into the full section of the beam. And then, as you as we go into the beam, you've got this transition area um, from one wire to the next, and then a series of of expansion joints th th throughout the tunnel, and then they're dependent on the length of the tunnel. So, so it's very similar to, to track. Um, we have you know, expansion joints um, in jointed track, or where, or where we have that CWR. You can see uh, just a little bit of movement there um, as it's gone into that expansion joint of breathers, as sometimes they've caught. So you can see a little, little bit of movement there. And again, uh, a couple of other things. Um, you can see there, the, looking up at the roof of the tunnel or the crown of the tunnel, you, we've got these in in some of the wet environment in the wet environments within the tunnels. We've got these covers, um, and th they're there to to take to keep water and to keep calcite buildup and minerals off off the top of the top of the beam, um, and with a modified sort of drip strip to, to prevent any capillary reaction of moisture going back up uh, between the, uh, uh, the side of the beam. 
and you can see in this area where we've got um, the ventilation shaft, there's a, there's a section, there's a good section there being installed to protect the, the external surface of the, of the conductor beam. And, and one of the things we've found is that there's, because the environments, um, and we're getting to know the environments in the tunnels, there's a likelihood is that you need to install more of these or as, as, the, as the environment changes in the tunnels. So a little bit on, on geometry. Uh, this is sort of a simplified version. Um, so the ten, you've got 10 meter spans, you, you can have just a nine meter, nine millimeter sag. Um, there was a 150 stagger uh, on, on tangent track uh, with, with, with a system height of, of circa 4.7, but it does, it does change depending on the, on, on, on the tunnel design. But that's a, that's a general, generalized uh, overview of some of the geometry. Um, and, and then, but perhaps an interesting uh, set of set of traces to, to give you a, a, a difference of the, the sort of the stagger arrangement. Um, if you look at the, the trace on the top left, this is a conventional sort of height and stagger uh, profile, as you can see. Um, so you can see that the it's, it's quite well defined uh, the stagger profile on, on open route, and you can see the height changes of the contact system where we, where the system sort of ducks and dives as it goes through uh, over bridges. If you look at the, the trace um, to, to the bottom right, which is on, off the uh, of, of the tunnel, um, you can see you've got this quite a different profile, which is the, the, sort of the generalized stagger of the, of, of the conductor beam. So it's, it's, it's quite a different trace altogether. Um, and then you can see the, the profile, the, the height profile, um, is, is, is a lot more constant at the, um, at the set contact wire height. So quite, quite an interesting profile. I'm not sure that the, the Frau Hopper system on the, on the, laser, uh, the laser system on the NMT train uh, is best placed to, to measure the stagger, uh, but we also do that um, with, the, with a height and stagger gauge and a trolley, man, trolley mounted height and stagger equipment. So the environment, um, again, just a very simple overview of the environment. I think the main thing is that they're all different and that would be no different as we'd all know with, with, with track in tunnels. Uh, if we were looking at track, we would have different challenges uh, with the track. So we look at Chip and Sodbury, you know, we, we know in places it's, it's, it's very wet. Uh, it's even wet in the summer when it's dry outside. Um, and we, we, what we notice there is, 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 is probably build, build up of calcite. Uh, Patchway is, is, is very dry, uh, but also very du dusty. Um, so, so that's what we have down there. Um, Seven Tunnel is, is, is wet in places. It, you know, contrary to popular belief, it isn't as wet as people think. Um, but there are long wet areas. Um, and, then, and obviously we're going into the seabed and, and, and under the sea. So there is, there is uh, varying, varying levels of sodium chloride. And then we've got some buildup of mineral, mineral deposits. And then of course, you've got the, the, the ventilation fans, fan in there, which does um, bring air in from outside. And, and that does give us, uh, I believe, some, some localized problems um, with um, some pollution on some of the insulators immediately around the, the shafts. And then, you know, typical in, in, in any tunnel, uh, any railway tunnel, you, you, you get diesel soot, ballast dust, grinding dust, you name it, every type of dust. And, and then we've got whatever went before um, and probably high levels of iron oxide in places. So a bit of a mixed bag, um, but there are some subtle differences between, between the, sort of the, the pollutants in the tunnels. Um, so these were meant to be videos, but nevertheless, we had some difficulty. But we've got a couple of photographs. And, and you can see um, we've got some additional uh, protective shields put in by the project, project uh, just on the end of the cantilever to, to divert uh, some of the water off these manifolds. So this is, this is a photo from the Seven Tunnel. Um, and there's a series of manifolds to collect the water and take them into the track drainage system and there's, some, there's been some additional shields put on um, by, by the project teams to keep the water off the beam um, and so that's a bit of a bit of a moving 
bit of a moving beast. The water management is is a, is, is a bit of a challenge and will, will always be a challenge um, you know, for the tunnel and it's a challenge for, for the PUA engineer as it is for the overhead line engineer. Um, but actually, it, it hasn't caused us too much. In terms of performance, um, performance in the tunnel has, has, has been very good. Um, we, we do get some overhead line trippings. Um, and, and some of those are under investigation, and some of those we've, we've currently uh, we've understood the root cause. Uh, and we do spend, um, we do do our very best to get to the bottom of the root cause for, for any overhead line trip, because with, with nine times out of ten, um, there, there, there is there is something to learn. Okay. Um, so this is an example of some cast type we spoke about. We spoke about some of the challenges in Chipping Fogbury. Um, the car site buildup is, is is a problem. It adds weight to the top of the beam, um, and and you know we make use of the of the protective cover. You can see that this you know, this sample hasn't got a protective cover, um, but it was uh, on a protective cover, and you can see that um, it, it was just migrating down. Uh, there was some quite large sections in there. And, and as part of the, that's one of the maintenance requirements is to remove is to remove those buildups of calcite before they become uh, sort of too difficult to move. And particularly if they get if they build up around the uh, the, 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 the swivel head and the bottom end of the cantilever or, or anywhere else on the um, on the on the insulator or the, or the drop tube. So that's something to, to be mindful of as as we go forward. As you can see. Um, the, the levels of calcite builder are, are, are pretty significant. Uh, we're not, we're not going to see that on the beam, obviously, but we, but we do see some, some buildup. Um, what you can see in, in the top right hand photograph is, is, is a short circuit risk where we've got this stalactite coming down nicely. Um, and you can see the shadow of it there in the, in, off, off the camera, but you can see the stalactite, and that's a, actually that's a, that's a risk to an overhead line trip. So that's has been knocked off. That's the sort of thing we'd knock off on a on a, on a foot patrol. So, so those are little th little, little things like that um, can make a big difference. Okay, and isoclose are another one. Again, it's it's not um, it's not unique to the, to the rock system. Whatever overhead line system you have, and if you've got wet a wet tunnel, you you and it's cold. Um, isoclose are, are a risk. You can see. Uh, we had an issue in February when we had that cold snap. Um, we, we had a few um, icicles forming, and this is one from from Chipping Sobri um, in in February. This wasn't I don't, this wasn't ha actually hanging down. This was on the side of the tunnel. Um, but, but the point to note is that when well, we had the beef from the east a couple of years ago, we didn't really have a problem with icicles. Um, but because it rained for about a month before we had the, the cold snap in February, um, we did experience this time. Um, so isoclose. So that's something to, to bear in mind. Um, we don't want isoclose to fall off. So we try and knock them off before we can, before they do fall off. And obviously there are risks to, to pantographs and train drivers and train cabs and, and people walking through the tunnel and anybody else who happens to be working in or around the tunnel. So isoclose are, are all one to watch. Um, and if you go to Scotland, um, it, it, it's, it's a real problem for them so annually, whereas for us, um, it's, it hasn't been so uh, so much of a problem. Um, so we touched on we touched on ventilation um, earlier on. This is a, a very traditional uh, old cross, cross section of the tunnel, but it gives you an idea of 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 the set with the seven tunnels, just what what the gradients are. And there's a couple of things here. One is the air comes in and obviously goes out, um, but at the bottom of the shafts, we've noticed um, some localized uh, pollution buildup. On the, on the insulators, uh, which which need a bit of a focus in terms of in terms of cleaning, and and the other thing we need to be mindful of is as the train comes into the tunnel, it, it, it's got less traction draw than it goes along the bottom, and as it comes up, um, we're likely to see a different wear pattern as it as it goes up the bank or up the gradient than it does coming down, and and that's something to note of if we measure the contact wire wear now and over the next over the coming years, uh, we're going to really feel for deterioration rates. So that's an important point. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, about that in a, 
in a minute or so. So inspection uh, and maintenance requirements. So um, the, uh, as we mentioned earlier on, it, 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 the rock system is, is designed and, and uh, engineered by Froome Frey. So the training was the initial training to the over line teams was by Froome Frey and um, also some internal training by uh, the Network Rail team working for uh, Network Rail PD&T, professional development and training. And, and from that, we've, we've, we're in the process and have indeed uh, written some, some work instructions uh, really based on, uh, on, on the extensive and detailed uh, F and F um, maintenance manuals. Okay, so in, in terms of in terms of inspections, I suppose they're, they're not too dissimilar to what we used to do um, with, with, with track. Um, in, in terms of uh, sort of you know, the foot patrols and or, or the more detailed inspections. So uh, high level early failure inspections, which is a one-off check which we carry out on uh, overhead line systems, whether it's in a tunnel or whether it's uh, open route. Uh, and, we, and we do a sample check. We've indeed we've done some sample checks of, of the series one overhead line system across the route and indeed um, of the rock system. And then uh, foot patrols, um, no, the, the frequency of these foot patrols is, is really dictated by, by the environment. So we're still finding our feet, uh, no pun intended, on uh, on foot patrols. They, you know, as, as we become uh, experienced and, and familiar with the environment, the frequencies of patrols uh, will, will change depending on what, what, what risk is. Um, and they're likely to, to, to be pushed out as, as we go. They're a little bit conservative at the moment, but in, ter in, in time, um, you know, we will learn from the from what we find, and then we, our confidence levels will will uh, will go up. Um, likewise, with high level inspections, um, they're they're a little bit conservative, and as we understand the tunnel, its performance, some of the things we need to do, which perhaps we thought we didn't need to do, um, and implement some of the tools we, we, we've we've now developed. Um, we, those frequencies, you know, are, are likely to change. Um, post incident inspections. So, as we said, if we have a trip um, or a, a short circuit, uh, a short circuit tripping or an ADD, which is an automatic drop device on the pantograph. So, if the pantograph becomes damaged, we, we will, and the train uh, is brought to a stand, we will carry out um, an, an immediate inspection of the tunnel. Um, sometimes, sometimes we've had problems on the outside of the tunnel and they've been exported to, to the inside. Um, so we need to be mindful of that when we have an ADD as to exactly where that is. And then obviously there's the periodic inspections uh, carried up with the civilis team and they will look at the, the the attachment of the drop tubes to, to, the, um, to, the, to the roof for the lining of the, of, of the tunnel. So we have to be mindful that um, we, we, we've got a, a, a brick line tunnel which, which is old um, and be there for hundreds of years. So and we bolted um, an overhead line system to it. So there is there is uh, a, some poor tests done uh, at a set frequency to, to understand the, the integrity of the of, of the civil aspect of, of the system. And then um, perhaps more importantly for us, uh, not not more importantly, but one thing we, we, we realize we, we need to do in it perhaps in addition to the above is really to get a good uh, understanding of, of, of water ingress and how it changes, if it, if it changes, uh, but it's likely to change, um, and work with uh, the civils team, because if we spring a leak in the tunnel and it's affecting the overhead line system, then that, that, that leak needs to be managed so we don't, we don't adversely affect um, the, the system. Uh, so there's a, there's a synergy to be, to be working with um, with the civilis team. Um, pollution monitoring, um, obviously any insulator in the tunnel um, isn't isn't self cleaning because insulators generally work by being self cleaned by being outside in the open environment. Um, it, it, insulator pollution has, has always been uh, a challenge or given given a challenge to the to the overhead line engineering tunnels, whether it's a, a polymeric insulator or whether it's a porcelain insulator or whether it be, be a, a conventional system or a, or a rigid 
uh, conductor bar system, insulated pollution is is, is just a, a fact of life uh, in, in tunnels. Uh, some tunnels are, are, are more are more pollutant than others, um, and we, we've, we've touched on that earlier on. And then cotton, to just to get a view for the sort of future asset management um, renewal strategy, understanding over over the, over the con coming control period, um, contact wire where now we contact why we're where we last but it's probably 30 years but nevertheless it, it's good to understand what those uh, what the deterioration is um, uh, particularly at certain locations and that will inform uh, the sort of the asset management strategy that if we know it now it's something we can plan for in, in future control periods okay so we touched on cleaning um and the important point to note is, is it's not just us, or it's not just the network rail uh, or red line engineer who needs to clean their insulators. There's a uh, there's a, there's an engineer there on the back of a back of a, a high level basket cleaning his insulators, and so it's, it's a challenge to to work to a lot of uh, people who work in distribution, uh, power distribution, or um, or red line, um, and what. A couple of points to note for, for us is that we do clean insulators. Um, there's an interface between the poly polymeric uh, uh, shrouds or sheds, as, they, as they're called, and, and, and the and the um, and the abutting flange or the stainless steel flange. So this area uh, where, where we do clean uh, the insulator it needs to be uh, treated with a little bit of caution. And, um, and in terms of if you're going to use a pressure washer, then you would keep the PSI down. Uh, so we don't blow the end off uh, or break the seal. Um, so just a little bit of caution when we do clean them. And likewise, when we clean them, you know, you, we, we need to be mindful that we don't damage the, the sheds and uh, sort of cause any scores or, or nicks. Um, so that's quite important to note. So we, we touched on insulator cleaning and the importance of insulator cleaning. Um, and this is the, the top photograph here is just an example of uh, this was down near Patchway and this was a cantilever outside the tunnel. You can see there were some pollutants blown off freight wagons, um, which did sort of pollute the underside of the insulator, whereas the, the, the top of the insulator is, is perfectly clean because it's been washed off. Um, but you can see the bottom, just a little bit there, you know, perhaps over time, you know, could become... Uh, an insulator to give it a give it a good clean, but not now, but, but certainly at some point in the future. So we, whilst it's outside, um, it, it is literally just on the on the mouth of the tunnel. And this uh, photograph on the bottom is is one an insulator which we've taken out and we've, we've cleaned by hand. Now we wouldn't take them out normally clean them by hand. But this is just a bit of a, a a bit of an experiment really. Um, so they can be cleaned. Um, and I guess the, the, the challenge is, is that we, we clean them at the right time um, so we don't clean them before they need to be cleaned. And that's something we will take a look at um, in, in a minute. So um, we've had the occasional short, uh, short circuit um, of, of insulators um, and we've, had, um, we, we've not really had a problem with insulators themselves as being defective. I think we've had three or four um, along the, the Great Western route since um, since phase one was built. Um, so we've had a few insulators fail, but that was really down to manufacturing defects. Um, so the, inside the insulators, there's an extruded uh, glass fiber core, and, and there's been some impurities found inside the core. Um, so whilst this insulator is, is, is slightly polluted, um, they do have a very sort of large um, uh, creepage length, hence by the number of sheds, so they can withstand um, quite, you know, they're quite resilient to, to pollution. Um, but nevertheless, this one has failed and, and is currently um, in Italy being investigated. So they, they open it up, have a look at the core, and then make a judgment um, and make a judgment as to why it's failed. So we can't assume it, it, it failed um, through pollution because uh, we, we just don't know that. So the evidence will lead us to uh, what the cause of the uh, of that failure of that insulator was. And then you can see um, just where, where we went from the live side to the dead side and, and that 
that's just them and there's their of them actually actual flash over it looks like somebody's taking a welding stick to it um, but I think that's the but that's the energy going across the insulator um, then short circuit risks we, we, we spoke about this briefly um, you've got the the stalactite is something to look out for we've seen a few of these and then you've got some very localized buildup uh, of pollution I believe this was one around the, the ventilation shafts. Then Tom got, Tom's going to talk us through insulator uh, performance monitoring. Over to you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, um, just a, a, a very basic slide. Um, so, can everyone hear me okay, Daryl? Am I coming yes. through? Yep. yep. So, uh, it's obviously in our interest to minimise or, or target maintenance uh, activity uh, in the areas that really need it rather than taking a kind of a blanket approach. There's um circa 1700 insulators in the in the tunnel and it, if, if we treated them all the same given that they all exist in different conditions then uh, it, it could be uh, overly expensive so we have a series of uh monitoring walkouts that, that currently happen uh, bi-weekly and and the team goes through with some clever equipment which can detect uh discharge which isn't um, necessarily audible to the human ear or visible with with the eye so they look at every single insulator uh, take a sort of quantitative measurement of the discharge um, we use that data and plot that data to kind of show us where the worst performing areas are and then we can target maintenance there accordingly so uh, the the diagram at the top uh, just shows it's quite useful to see where the uh, sort of problem areas are um, in relation to the geography of the tunnel. Uh, you can see there that we're seeing more, more activity towards the English portal. Um, there could be a number of reasons for that. There's some, uh, I believe, a geological fault uh, in that area, and that may lead to sort of increased water in incursion into the tunnel and subsequently uh, more saline water falling onto the beam. Um, and then the other two pictures below that, just um, there's the sort of uh, plan view of the, or section view of the, the, the tunnel and a basic kind of bar graph or bar chart showing areas of uh, higher, higher frequency of uh, partial discharge. So um, again, you can see sort of closer to the English portal, uh, there's higher activity. But also there's a big bar you, you'll notice just under um, subbrook shaft, uh, the, the ventilation shaft. And that's because all the sort of hypothesis with that is the ventilation fans are sucking in a lot of uh, damp saline air and kind of pumping it over the insulators, if you like. So we see uh, greater activity there. I mean, given that information, yeah, we, we can target the maintenance accordingly and split the tunnel into kind of broad sections and have different uh, cleaning frequencies uh, for a given section. Um, that, that's really it. Thank you very much, Tom. Great. Okay. And then we looked at, so we mentioned electrical discharge. Um, and so the other piece of, of, of equipment we were, were trialing is, is a corona camera to look at the corona discharge. Uh, and, and you can see that there's some inventory there um, of, of the electrical discharge, which is with the corona camera, it sort of with the corona discharge, it sort of ionizes the air uh, around it, and that, that can cause us some problems. So we're 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 trialing some technology um, to see if we can make better decisions in terms of cleaning, rather than saying it all needs to be cleaned. We 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 can't start at one end and go to the other. Um, we need to target our cleaning. Um, so we will look at um, some some technology. It's established technology. Um, it used in other industries to, to see if it can help us target um, where, where we need to clean and that will inform uh, our decision making. And then photograph on the left is, you can, this was meant to be a video, um, but nevertheless, um, you can see a little bit of arc in there, in, in, uh, there's some, there's some bit of discharge and then you can see some burn off, which I think the, the orange glows tend to be the carbon, some carbon deposits and, and where you get this uh, little bit of tracking, that's, that's a little bit of discharge. Okay, so a couple of other things. We, we've had a little bit of debris off the tunnel. Um, so you can see there's, there's a wet area here. These bricks have, have decayed uh, over time. A little bit has fallen onto the beam. 
and, and we've had one or two instances where we, we were a bit of a flash in the bang um, and, the, and the pans pick something up. Uh, it, it's quite rare, but we've had one or two examples of, of that. So we do get fallen bodies, for want of a better word, uh, coming onto the falling off the tunnel, um, either into the pantograph well. Um, but of course, the benefit of the conductive beam is, is you, you, you're less likely to get a failed dropper or a jumper. Um, which, which is, it's a very simple system in that sense. Um, so you, you, you're unlikely to get anything falling off the beam, um, but, but you do occasionally get something falling off the um, off the wall of the tunnel, um, albeit it's only a small object, but it did give us a, a bit of a flash. And then um, the other thing we look out for is any hard spots. You can see there's a, there's a little bit of adjustment here. Uh, of, of, of the cantilever, probably probably a little bit low. Um, little, little things like this, um, we, we pick up on patrols. And, you know, contrary to popular belief, you know, we, we do get birds in tunnels. Um, and on, on a very recent foot patrol, uh, we had three pigeon carcasses um, about half a mile in. So not what you'd expect. Um, I know we found ducks in the seven tunnel before. Um, but to find three pigeons uh, some way in the tunnel, um, you know, again, that could be associated with, 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 a, with a tripping. Um, I, I, I recommend we've got general clearances, but nevertheless, the wingspan on pigeons can, could give us, a, give us a short circuit. So that was a bit of a surprise recently that we felt we had a, we had a few pigeons in there. So you know, in, in terms of service life, there, there are some sort of generic uh, component service life. For, for insulators and galvanized steel and, and so on and contact wire. Um, you know, if you look at if you look at some of the contact systems in, in the north of England, they've been in for 50, 60 years, so and, and performed, you know, relatively well given their age and, and, and their environment. So 40 years sounds a long time. Um, but we have equipment which I thought they lasted 40, 50 years. Um, so, so that's where we are, and it's really down to the, the way the tunnel is managed. Like anything, if, if if you do your best to look after it, you get the you know, get the service life out of it. So there's a there's a there's a bit of work to be done, uh, and as as we can see, uh, as our knowledge uh, grows over time, we, we can make those uh, make, make those informed decisions. And I think we're we're a few steps along the the long, the long journey. Uh, so uh, some of the some of the equipment to address uh, some of the challenges. Um, Corona, we're going to monitor sort of the electrical discharge, as as, uh, as Tom mentioned. Um, so we're going to look at the, the discharge and to understand how many insulators we've got, where that discharge is, that will inform our keening. It also inform uh, if we know the detail of that. Should we have an overhead line trip, uh, we can quickly look up where we've got the higher readings and that will focus our response. Because I think the challenge is um, looking for a, a failed insulator uh, in, in, a, in a dark environment, which I don't know whether is a, you know, there are le varying levels of pollution, isn't easy. Uh, whilst we have distance to fault information, um, that, that is only a, a, a generalization. It doesn't, isn't, doesn't, doesn't pinpoint where the fault is. So um, we, we're going to use um, we had some trials of some corona, of the Corona camera. Uh, we, we've had a demonstration recently. And we're going to trial it in the in the chip in, in the seven tunnel over the summer. Um, so Corona camera detection equipment has been tried on on the on the uh, on the recording train some couple of years ago, and, and I think there is appetite to to install uh, Corona camera technology on the, on the measuring fleet. So, whilst this is a handheld foot patrol, um, I, I think there's, an appetite, there's a growing appetite to, to inspect uh, to insulators at, you know, at over bridges and, and tunnels and so on uh, with, with, a, with a tray mounted camera. Um, it's certainly been tried. Uh, it was tried on the NMT, on the, on the mentor train, the network where mentor train, uh, about three years ago. And I think there's there's, a, there's an aspiration to, to, to revisit that, that trial to see if um, the camera can be uh, brought into service. So there's a bit of work there. Uh, contact wire measurement we've touched on. Um, it's, 
to, to, to sort of negate the need to go up in a basket to measure contact wire where we, we've developed um, locally working with a company called Haztec, a device to, to monitor, to enable us to monitor uh, the contact wire using um, sort of a laser on a pole, for want of a better word, uh, with, um, with a fixture on the end to take a datum from the, the bottom of the conductor beam. So we can fire up a laser and then work out the, the, the wear uh, and we can, that goes, get sent into the iPad and auto generates uh, an Excel sheet. And then we've sort of color coded uh, sort of the, the wear rates. So if you're 20% if you're worn or 30% worn, you're in the green and then you go into amber and, and then you need to change it in the red. And then there's some wear tables um, based on uh, depth of wear and, and width of flat and so on. So there's a bit of work there. This trial is gonna happen in the next uh, three or four weeks. Um, we'll, and we'll be able then from there on to do a probably uh, an annual or a biannual check of, of, of contact wire wear. And then um, there's, there's another piece of, piece of work being done to, to modify a MUP. So we, we recognize there's a, there's a requirement to clean insulators and we recognize the best way to do that is, um, is in a similar manner to what was carried out by um, by the contractor and the project team to the clean insulators. So there's a mute being uh, retrofitted with a with an auto bowser so to enable um, the network rail teams to go in and spot clean where we need to. Uh, and then uh, you know but we, we've got to like to have a look at the inside of the of the beam. Um, so we, we will do probably every three or five years just a, a spot check to have a look and see what's going on inside. Uh, the locate the inside the beam and we'll, we'll stick a boroscope up to, to take a look. And then on to um, to Elena. And, um, everyone. Um, so I'm I'm going to give you a quick overview on a Pantobot 3D and who is interested to uh, you know everything more in detail. Uh, you can um, go back to the previous uh, presentation we had last year, as Daryl said, and uh, um, I think it, that one is more deep than this one. So, um, because from December 2019, uh, the Whaley system from uh, our region, Western Western, uh, saw some of the like highest pantograph passes per day, it was decided to install a system to monitor all this, uh, these pantographs. So uh, Pantobot 3D will provide in real time um, pantograph condition monitoring and free Ford is gonna assist in the early uh, identification of the root cause uh, of uh, damage to pantographs. So Pantobot 3D will uh, alert uh, network rail and uh, uh, train operator uh, companies of uh, Pantobot, Pantobot that are outside operational uh, limits. Um, on the left image, you can see um, what we call a wayside uh, installation, um, while on, uh, on the right picture, you can see uh, an overhead mounting frame, uh, and this is what we have in Western, uh, because it is much more feasible if you have to monitor for trucks uh, to use this overhead mounting uh, frame. Uh, next, Daryl, please. Um, so Heathrow uh, has installed this Pantobot uh, 3D since October, October to 2018. And because uh, they have only two trucks to monitor, um, they've choose uh, a wayside uh, installation. Um, this system now it is managed and maintained by, uh, by, uh, by Network Rail. Uh, next panel, please. So you can see here some uh, pantograph anomalies which were identified uh, at uh, Heathrow. Uh, left side, you can see uh, horn damage. Um, and on the right picture, you can see um, a carbon chip which was uh, identified. Uh, next, please. 
So uh, w once um, these images uh, are captured, um, they are pre-processed and then they are uploaded to a remote uh, server uh, for a final uh, analysis. Uh, these results will be displayed on the screen through the user interface, which is called Pantobot Pro, is what you, you can see now uh, uh, on the slide. So all those measurements are presenting using a, like a simple color code to represent the um, condition of the pantograph. And um, the pan is inspected for where chips cracks against a preset threshold. Uh, you can see on the, on the left side, we have some filters where you can filter uh, the events by uh, train, or you, you can even choose the pantograph type. Uh, and uh, if you wanna see, it's like the events in a range of like a day or a week or a... so um, you can see there is a, a red where is uh, the carbon uh, there is a red this is what i'm talking when i'm saying the color code uh, is highlighted in red which means we have a problem with uh, it might be a carbon chip it might be where it might be uh, so you can see the pantograph the picture of the pantograph in the middle and on the right side you can see what was generated uh, uh, by the uh, by the by the, prog the the program uh, next slide please Darrell. so um, what we have here is like on on west and western route uh, we will install a pantobot on overhead mounting frame as i said uh, previously on various locations. So we have Western route where the Pantobot camera is gonna be uh, installed on a bridge. Um, we have South Hall uh, and, and the other, the rest of the, the location, they will be on uh, existing uh, structures. So South Hall, uh, Reading West, Didcot, uh, Bristol Parkway and, uh, and Seven Tunnels. The, the right picture at uh, the top, uh, shows the trial installation, which uh, it took place at Swindon Training Center. And um, we are expecting uh, in early June uh, to commission DITCOT. And uh, in late June, uh, we are hoping for Bristol Parkway. Thank you. Over to you, Thanks, Elena. Thank you very much. Okay, we're, we're, we're almost there. Uh, perhaps a, a bit of a closing slide and one more thereafter so um that's that's really where we are um you know, obviously we've, we've got a design life um and it's, we will do our very best to get up, up to that um and, and there's, a, there's a few techniques and, and, and tricks which will help us do uh, the good right, the right maintenance in the right place at the right time uh, over the coming years so in, insulators um need 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 the a continued focus, I guess, um, to make sure we get the best system performance. Um, and that's, again, that, that is a challenge uh, for any overhead line system, uh, whether it's a, a conventional system or a, or a conductive beam system uh, when, you, when you're in a tunnel. Uh, what we do know with, with historic tunnels, you, you, you've got uh, various pollutants um, and we've got a bit of freight traffic traffic knocking around open top freight traffic which will get some blow off from there as well so insulate the performance uh, we need to keep that up um contact wire measurement less, less perhaps less so important in the in the near term because it's not going to the way the, the wire doesn't wear that that quickly uh, it's quite a long uh, wear and slow it's a slow process for contact wire to wear so uh, but it's good to know what the, the determination is so you can forecast you can forecast any any, any future replacement. Um, interesting to see what the differences are in, 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 in where we go up a, up a gradient in, in some of the tunnels and, and under the aluminium wire. Um, that will be interesting to see. Um, and then it, the, perhaps the key for us in asset management is to make sure we, we utilise what the inspections are telling us and you know from, from the scope patrol, high level patrols and any any events we have and, and, and any feedback from civils and we feedback to them um, and water management. So those are the things um, we're, we're becoming, uh, we need to become familiar with and, and good at to uh, to make sure we continue to get get good system performance because on the whole the, 
rock system that performed very well. Um, it, it was a few teething problems at the start, um, but those have been those have been largely addressed, I believe. So in terms of everyday performance, um, it's very good. And we will increase our knowledge over time in, in terms of maintenance and, and asset management. And we have the added benefit of, of, of looking at um, pantograph performance uh, from the pantograph monitoring stations uh, across the roof. So that gives us that pantograph monitoring um, is, is, is a really good tool for, for monitoring uh, almost over the line system health because if, if the pounds are running well, it, it, it's an indication that there's nothing seriously wrong with your red line. If you start getting chips in pantographs and the chips get bigger or you get more chips, then there's something out of kilter on the asset. Um, and so we've strategically placed pantograph monitoring across the route to try and break it down, break the sections down, so we can actually find the, the needle in the haystack um, and not struggle to find the haystack, as it were, when things go wrong. Um, but so, so we do. We have, we have the added, added benefit and perhaps the luxury of, of pantograph monitoring and uh, other other systems such as alerts. We've got the overhead line real time monitoring system, uh, which is installed on uh, many of the uh, six of the three eight seven and the GWR class three eight seven. There's a there's an alliance between Network Rail and, and GWR with um, some uh, real time monitoring of pantograph um, performance um, on the GWR train. So that, that gives us an insight uh, into, um, into system performance and pantograph performance as well. Okay, so I think we're down to the last one. So, Gilles, over to you. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much, Daryl, Tom, and Elena. Um, if you've got any question to ask, please put them in the chat. And we've got Simon, uh, who's already posted one. So, Simon, do you want to come in and ask your question? I'm happy for you to answer, ask it. Okay, so, so Simon is asking, uh, are the images of the pantographs analysed by operatives or AI machine learning? It's machine so, learning. Yes, yeah. yeah, it is. And what we can do after, uh, so if we get uh, an alert or something, um, we can just uh, go and open Pantobot Pro and check the pictures just, just to confirm, you know, what's, what's, actually, what, what's actually happening. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, a question for me, then, uh, Darrell, you know, being a, a track engineer myself, uh, one of the things that may happen is uh, is damage to over a system when using the big machinery, the RVs, you know, the diggers underneath. Um, how susceptible to damage is the, the rocks? Uh, it's, it's, it's very robust in that sense, but if you were to, if you were to damage it, I mean, it depends on the, on the severity of the damage, isn't it? But you can, um, depending on where that, that damage is, you, you could, if it was to the beam and to the extruded aluminium beam and to the contact wire, you can uh, take out a section, uh, so remove a section, um, and um, install new contact wires. So you could put a short section in, in the in the non-tensioned area. So you could cut it out, uh, or take out, take it out, take a section of beam out after joints where the, where the plates are, um, and then run new wire. But what you need to do, you'd have to put some anchor bolts in just to retain, um, you know, to, to, to make sure you you, you can. Uh, where, where you put the new joints, as it were, put some anchor bolts in there. Um, so you can, it can, it can be done. Um, it's in, it's in the manual. Uh, there is a, there is a prescribed uh, a, a section in the in the uh, rules where manual is to do that. Um, it's, you know, let's hope we don't damage it. But um, I, I believe in the construction uh, of, of of some track work. It had a, it had a your your knock. Um, I suppose you, you could argue it, it, it's um, is it. If it if it if it's damaged to a beam or, or a kink is a is a kink in the wire or or a bend, it's probably a little bit more work than it would be 
with a conventional system because you know, if, if you kink the, the, the contact wire in an open root section, uh, you can put a set of rollers on it and straighten it out and and, and you, you you know or so you'd be okay. Um, so it, it, it's it's a we have to be very cautious when we do do work under the beam, um, but that's that's just the way it is. Um, but no different to any other uh, any other overhead line system in that sense. You know we just need to be mindful of it. Okay, uh, thank you, Darren. Um, Simon Warren, would you like to come in and ask your question? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's only me, but Simon's voice is very distorted. Yes, it's still here. Okay, so I think it's probably best to to, to grab a question from the. Yes, sorry, Simon. Yeah, we can't we can't hear you. So I'll, I'll read a question out of the um, of the chat. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Where does the data uh, from the Pantobot go? Is that into Ops RAM team signaling, or does it depend on the level of damage? Good question, Elena. Would you like to take that one, or would you like me to to take that one? I'll happily take it. Yeah. Okay. In, t in terms of severity of damage, um, it, there's there's a piece of work to be done to get it into um, in, into operations at the moment, as, as, as it stands at the moment. Uh, but the Heathrow system is is the Heathrow system, and and that's managed internally by Heathrow. Um, in t in terms of the the, the 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 systems which are due to be commissioned um, over the summer and the autumn. Initially, that data will go into uh, into asset management, um, and, and what we'd like to do is to, is to refine some of the alerts and the alarms. So we will keep a close watch on that. But ultimately, it, it'll it'll go into operations and uh, also be available to the talks. I'm sorry, I was on mute, Daryl. I was. <laughs> That's okay. I think we've I think we've got to the Thank bottom you. of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we answered the, the second question as well. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's uh, capture Steve's question as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, any other questions? Yeah, right, Simon. Yeah, you need to change your headset, definitely. Um, okay, so um, I think we, we're going to conclude this, this session uh, now. So I'd like to thank Darren, Tom, and Elena very much uh, for coming and presenting to us today. It was very uh, informative uh, presentations. Um, as I said before, you know, at this forum is. Um, PWI is not only you know track engineers now; it's, it's about infrastructures, and OLE um, is definitely um, more and more of a subject that's going to be discussed. If you've seen the the last PWI journal, you know you've got a sense that uh, um, it's become a very important uh, subject uh, as well as track, you know, for for PWI. So, um, uh, thank very much again for for coming. And our next meeting, as I said earlier, would be on the 60th of June. Uh, and I hope to see you all then. You're welcome, Jules. If you'd like us to come back to talk about something else um, in the future, you feel, feel free to do so. Um, we're doing a piece of work on, on, on sort of wire uh, deterioration. So maybe we can share some of that next, next year with you. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you very much for, for the offer. Um, certainly, we want to give the right balance between the different uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of permanent waste truck infrastructure. So, yes, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll get a uh, really subject um, again soon. Okay, right. thank you very much, everybody. See you next time. Thanks for having